I'm David Griffin, I'm at Derbyshire County Cricket Club on the 7th of August 2017 and I'm here to talk to Harold Rhodes. Good morning Harold. Good um, morning. Before we start, it's worth just giving you a, an introduction because you're one of Derbyshire's more notable uh, cricketers. You're the son of a notable cricketer in, in AEG, Dusty or Burt Rhodes. Um, you took over a thousand wickets, almost I think it was 993 for the county at, at an average of only 18. You played Test cricket for uh, England, one of only 24 cricketers to do so that whilst they were on Derbyshire's staff. And uh, you were born in the year that Derbyshire won their one and only county championship back in 1936. Mm -hmm. But before we get to all of that, where did it all start? What are your first cricketing recollections? Uh, well, with my father being a cricketer, I'd obviously always been interested because there were always cricketers coming to the house, uh, players who played during my dad's time. And so I was always on the back lawn playing cricket. Uh, and other people were helping me and joining in. So I had a very good start to my cricket with all those people about. What sort of names would, would these have been? Members of the 36? Well, people side, like Alan, Alan Revel and really? you know, George Dorks, people like that. Really? Yeah. Mm. Wonderful. And so presumably then when you got to school, uh, where, where you play your formative cricket, mm. you, you'd already got a bit of a grounding. Oh yes, I was very fortunate. I was. At, I was able to, um, uh, through my father and knowing the coach down here at the time was, was Harry Elliott, I was able to come down after school and practice with the ground staff, which, you know, was quite a privilege. And when would that be, mid to late 40s? Well, while I was still at school. Right, mm. OK. So you were playing, and, and the, you, you played club and ground? I played club and ground and second team, yeah. Right. And although you became renowned as a genuinely out and out fast bowler, you didn't start as a No, I started as a spin bowler, I was an really? off spinner. Really? And I used to bat number five, six. Uh so I was I was an all rounder as such. Really? Yeah. So what where did the change come from bowling off breaks to, to Well, I stuff? used to have a lot of trouble with my spinning finger. Um I used to rip the skin off. I was a big spinner of the ball and uh it really, when it was while it was healing up, um, Cliff Gladwin saw me standing in the nets and said, "Well, um, can't you try and bowl something else? You know, rather than stand, <laughs> you know, just practicing fielding and things like that." So I tried to bowl like my father bowled, and in actual fact, didn't bowl it too badly. Although I didn't bowl a very good googly. And I actually made my debut at Oxford University, but actually bowling leg breaks and googlies. Yeah. Well, I was going to come on to that because you're still only one of six players under the age of 17 to play first-class cricket for Derbyshire. I think at the time you were the youngest, weren't you? Mm. So how did that debut come about? Did you, what progress had you been making? And were you sort of ready for the first team? Was it, was it an expected promotion? Oh, it was in a way a bit of a surprise, but it... it Bowling leg breaks seemed to come quite easy to me, quite natural, and uh, I was able to, you know, bowl a length, and that even though I wasn't as good a bowler as my father, but they decided to play me at Oxford, um, which, you know, I was pleased about. I, I didn't have a great debut, I didn't take a wicket, I was run out first ball, <laughs> <laughs> so it, it wasn't very distinguished. And what was your, what did the team makeup of the team look like on that day? Must have been some. Well, the team was legendary players. In I there, can't I remember what the team was actually, but I think playing at Oxford, there was, you know, one or two people that that played that weren't regulars. I can't remember right. who they were. But the team that you did subsequently graduate into mm. um, was one presumably of the, the, the great lineage of quick bowlers, particularly that you followed, mm. uh, Gladwin Jackson. Uh, they, these guys must have been around at that time. Mm. Did you feel you were in distinguished company or, or were you, did you feel positive about your own uh, ability and your own... Well, before, before I go on to that, um, I, I would like to just... Because uh, I missed it out in my book, I don't know why, because <laughs> it was quite an important thing at the time. I could have gone to Middlesex. Um, really? Yeah. Uh, my father was very friendly with Walter Robbins, who was chairman at Middlesex. Yep. And they'd been to watch me in a second team game and he phoned my father up and said, look, we'll offer your lad a, a, a job on the Middlesex ground staff. And uh, my father, I came back home, I'd been offered uh, the opportunity to come down here and start in April. 
the following season and uh, he said well I've got this offer for you from Lords. it's up to you um, he said sleep on it and he gave me Walter Robbins's number and I said to my dad next morning I said well I'm a Derbyshire lad uh, you played for Derbyshire I'm going to play for Derbyshire and he said, and I rang Walter Robbins and he understood and said thank you for the call and I wish you all the best so what mm. happened to me later on it makes you wonder what might have happened if I'd have been at Lords. Well, it's funny you should say that because we're, we're talking today and uh, as the news just a couple of days ago has filtered through about uh, the death of Derek Morgan and um, quite a few people I've spoken to in the last few days talked about Derek's um, failure is probably the wrong word, but is, is the fact he never got picked for England. And I know Derek, by his own admission, said Trevor Bailey was a fine player and he, he was always very magnanimous about it. But a lot of people still say, was, the, was it because he played for Derbyshire rather than for the county of his birth, which of course was ironically Middlesex? Well, we, we are an unfashionable county, there's no question about that. I mean, it, and it still goes on today. You know, if you look at people that have recently been selected mm. and things like that, <laughs> they never look, you know, north of the trend. No. Very sad, because when you think of the great players, and I suppose we've already mentioned Les, haven't we? He's another one mm. who played, played uh, twice, in two yeah. test matches, yeah, 12 mm. years apart. Mm. Um, I, I, you've referred to your book, and I'll go back to it, actually, because you referred to one particular game uh, in that book uh, against Yorkshire up at Chesterfield. You said it was one of the great victories of your time as a cricketer. Can you just expand on that? Tell us a little well, bit Well, I was about in the forces game. at the time and uh, doing national service and uh, I was based in Aldershot and uh, I got a, uh, well, I, I got a phone call from my commanding officer and I went to see him and he said, Derbyshire would like you to play and we're prepared to give you special leave to go and play against Yorkshire, which I did because I, 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 the following day, um, it happened to fit in, I was picked for the army against Oxford University. So <clears throat> anyway, I, I, they said, good luck, you, you know, you can play. And I went up and played against Yorkshire and we won by six runs and I got five wickets in the second innings. Yeah. Because Yorkshire were one of the powerhouses of... Oh, of absolutely, yeah. All time. the big guys were there, yeah. yeah. So did, what was it like playing at Chesterfield? Because people, I mean, today, I, I first went there in the early 70s and, you know, it is a, always a good atmosphere at Chesterfield, but people talk about the atmosphere there in the 50s and the 60s as being almost like a bear pit. Is that your recollection? Was no, it, was I mean, it, it was my favourite ground. Was of course, there was always a good atmosphere there. There was always more people watching than ever here. Yeah. This is a football town. It's not a cricket town. And uh, But the Chesterfield, they just love their cricket. And... Uh, we loved playing there and it was a, a good wicket to play on there as well you tended to get a result because it, the ball you know did a bit for you and, and there was usually a bit of pace in it and that's what you wanted it was a what you call a good cricket wicket and what was Derbyshire's attack that that, that day do you remember who was, who was presumably uh, I, Les was still Les was definitely playing I think yeah I think, think um, Les played um, I can't remember actually um, <laughs> I can't. I know Derek played, Laurie Johnson, people like that. And your captain would have been Donald then. Been Donald, yeah. I think. Yeah, yeah. Right. So you you touched on the army. So obviously national service was conscription. It was something you had to do. Did you pick the army or did they pick you? Did you, did you have a choice which service you went into? Oh no no no! I I went where where I was put. You know. And, right. Uh, so. I, but I mean, I was very fortunate, you know, I managed, I was a bit like Frank Blunston, who was the same place as me, played for Chelsea, yep. and he, he was never there, you know, and, and the same happened to me, I did, that wasn't the first time I played for Derbyshire, and, and obviously I played for the Army, combined services, I played for them, and so during the summer, I wasn't there, Yeah. and yet, I enjoyed it really in the army in a way it did me a lot of good discipline and that sort of thing and I became a full corporal and a squad instructor so I didn't waste my time I actually got stuck into a job and, yeah. and enjoyed doing it and I've got records of the squads that I took through training you know uh, something probably like about 20 squad, squads really? during that time and a lot of cricketers actually did do that didn't they I know Brian Close uh, Fred Truman, these were others who played a lot of, uh, went into the forces, didn't they, and then found them. So, so it must have been a good standard of cricket. 
Oh yeah, there was a lot of people available, um, to be honest. I mean, Peter Parfit played uh, in the combined services. He was in the RAF, I think, and uh, yeah, it was, there were good sides. I can't remember going back who played, actually, but uh, it's a long time ago. <laughs> So we come to, um, you, you finish your national service, you're back in the Derbyshire side, um, you get your county cap, 1958, was that, that must have been a, a proud moment, was it expected and who, who, how did you get your cap in those days, who, who was the, who awarded it to you, was it? Oh, the captain, captain did was it? it, yeah. Do you remember it? And well, I, it I, you see, I was fortunate because um, m my first game um, in championship cricket was against the great Surrey side at the Oval and I, I was first changed to Cliff and Les. Now, I played a whole season with those two, and uh, what I learned during that year, not because they sat down and talked to me, but just watching them and listening to things that went on. So I was a very fortunate person to have had that grounding and that schooling that I, I found out what was going on. I remember the first match that I played at the Oval, and I remember at lunchtime we'd been fielding, and came back from lunch and Gilbert Ride walked in with a piece of paper which had the bowling figures and he passed them to Donald Carr who looked at them and then gave it to me and I said, well, Skipper, shouldn't Cliff see this first? He's senior pro. He said, oh no, he said he knows. And I said, what do you mean? And he said, I'll tell you later on <laughs> when we have a pint in there. He told me, he said, they count every run. And after that day, I, and I always coached it as well with boys, wherever I coached, that you should always count your runs. And Cliff said to me, if you go for more than three runs and over, you're playing for them. Really? And that, that was, yeah, and that was very true. And, it, and that was what it was about, uh, Derbyshire line and length. Yeah. You know, uh, you'll play on a lot of wickets that don't give you any help at all. And you, you basically starve them of runs and yeah. they'll get themselves out. And that's what it was about. And I went in my career for 2.2 .2 runs per over. Uh, so at, I always say to myself, well, you did contribute towards make, winning some matches by doing that. Absolutely. And took them at 18, your wickets. I mean, that's yeah, yeah. phenomenally low average. I mean, nobody takes wickets at that sort of average today, mm. do they? Mm. Um, it, it's, a, it's fascinating hearing that because presumably you bowled with a third man. Mm, I mean, no, no opening bowler or no quick bowler would, would they? Mm. Well, we oh. always have a third man and a fine leg. I mean, I know today it's ridiculous. I, I find the stories that go yeah. down there. But Cliff said to me, he said, a lot of the time when people edge it down to third man, you've actually bowled a good ball that's found the edge and it unfortunately didn't carry to a slip or a gully. He said, why should they get four Absolutely. runs for it? You know, and that was his logic, and and but that's never been carried on. Do you know what the logic is of the mo in the modern game, Harold? Because I've I never, have no idea. I've never heard a satisfactory explanation for it. Because I agree with you, it is it's very rare in four-day cricket that a shot to third man is anything other than as a result of a bowler getting an edge. You know, mm. I agree. Why? Why for? And the cry here a lot of the time is get a third man in you it mm. all the time because mm. it seems so mm. wasteful. Um, so you've got a county cap, you're only 22, so very young, um, but England are on the radar. Um, within a year, you, you get picked for England. That must have been a, a, an amazing f feeling for you, a great achievement. Did you sense it was on the cards? Was there any, you know, around the place people, obviously word was around that Derbyshire had got this out and out quick. No, I, I, I had a clue. Really? I mean, no, I was very, very, very much concentrated on my own game here and it was a big shock to me. Um, Derek was picked at, as 12th man actually, yeah. uh, at the same match. But yeah, um, I played, picked and went up to Leeds. Peter May was captain and the first person who saw me was Fred Truman and shook me by the hand and said, You've done well, lad, he said. You've got to be 10% better than these southern buggers to get Did in. He? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I met Fred some years ago when we talked about Les Jackson and he mentioned a Middlesex fast bowler, and, uh, or I did rather, and he said, don't mention that man's name to me. He said he took Jackson's place many times when he shouldn't have done. Alan Moss. Uh, yeah. 
you know, I think he felt that there were a lot of Derbyshire players and northern northern players who didn't get there. He played actually Alan Moss, quite a pal of mine really. But he he um, he played. He, he opened the bowling with the Truman, and and I I came on first change. Now I got a wicket in my first over. Yeah. Yeah. Caught behind and finished up with four for fifty. Yeah. And that was at Leeds. At Leeds. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So good crowd. And Oh yeah, big crowd. Yeah. And and with with family there, were you were you able to? No, uh, did no, no. We had children, and my wife was you know right. looking after them. Yeah, we had young children. Yeah. So, th was there a sense? I mean, around English cricket, we we were, I was brought up on this that English cricket in the nineteen fifties had it was almost a golden age of fast bowling because there were just a plethora of of great fast and fast medium bowlers. Um, but you you'd only end up playing one more test. But, but any regrets about that? Any resentment about that now? Or do you just feel, well, there were some great bowlers around, I had my go and, and that was it? Or do you feel you should have played, given, been given more opportunity? Oh, I think I should have played, and, and, and people have always said I should have played a lot more uh, and that. Uh, the big disappointment was that um, when it came up about my suspect action, so to speak, um, the big disappointment was that the people at Lord's uh, took them eight years to, to sort the thing out and yeah. yet really as I said to them at several meetings that I used to have to go to to talk about this and look at pictures how can somebody throw the ball bowling close to the stumps like I did with the sideways on action yeah. it's physically impossible so when they in a way didn't accept that I sort of, obviously, like other people, begin to think, well, it, this is political, Yeah. you know. Um, well, of course, I'd be, I mean, I suspect today you'd be cleared in, in minutes, wouldn't oh, you? Yeah. Because the technology is there. Wasn't there, the, and there wasn't the technology no, then. But, I mean, I've seen the pictures, I've read your book, I've looked at all the footage, and I've read Fred Truman's uh, um, uh, pre preface to your book, you know. And, and the fact you were cleared, but it just took too long, didn't it? Mm -hmm. um, before we conclude this section of, of, of your contribution, I'd just like to go back to that team you played in in the 1950s. It was very unfortunate there was only one trophy to play for in those days, which was the county championship. And it was also unfortunate that Surrey, as you've just mentioned, they won seven championships in a row, and, and Yorkshire particularly were very strong. But we were a very... Derbyshire was a very, very good side, wasn't it? And came close... To, to, to winning the championship, mm. were, were, what sort of side was that? To, what was it like to play in that side? And, and, and perhaps just to mention one or two of the characters with Well, we just really, we lacked a, a couple of batsmen, really. That was the main thing. We always said we could bowl sides out uh, as cheap as any other side, uh, but we, we couldn't always get the runs and get ourselves into a good position. Um, I mean, in 65, for instance, we were second in the championship with a game in hand um, halfway through the season and yet finished halfway. The second half, the batters just couldn't get a run. So we, we had a lot of moments like that. Um, and like you say, if, if you get your wickets at 18 apiece, uh, and Brian Jackson was sim similar, yeah, Les was this lower still and, and Cliff Gladwin, you, you obviously did your job and you, you bowled well enough to win matches. But if you haven't got the batsman to get your runs, that's that's where we fell apart. And of course there wasn't the transfer merry-go-round that there is now in county cricket, so you mm. couldn't really go and recruit, mm. could you? Because well, we, we were a great fielding side, you see, as well. Great catches round the corner and at slip. and They hardly dropped anything. And I mean... Uh, that's fantastic, and that's what wins matches, but we couldn't get the runs. Mm. Well, Harold, it's been fascinating, this first interview, just hearing about your early years in, in the game, and I know shortly we're going to move on and talk about uh, some of the more uh, interesting elements of your career, so thank you very much. OK, thank you.